88, when my wife and I, and at that time Daniel and Catherine were only born, uh, Joanna was on her way, uh, we had the opportunity to spend that summer in Israel, living between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, right along what they called the Green Line. The Green Line was the separating line between the Jews and the Arabs. And there was a lot of political debate going on at that particular time. And, of course, uh, the compound that we lived at called Tantur uh, was primarily serviced by the Palestinian Arab community. And they loved to sit down and talk with Americans because somehow they felt that we Americans had influence over our uh, congressmen and senators and other type people. They don't realize that we're just helpless slaves like the rest of them and that nobody listens to us just like nobody listens to their, uh, their government officials listen to them. But they would want to talk to us. And their big plea was the land of Israel and Jerusalem belongs to us through Ishmael to Abraham. And they believed that the promise of the land belonged to them through Abraham's son, Ishmael. Because it was prophesied that through Ishmael would come 12 tribes and that they would rule. When you would listen to the Jewish people, they would say, that's all wrong. The land belongs to us through Isaac to Abraham. And Isaac was the son of promise. And Ishmael was cast off. Of course, the Arab folks did not accept the full account of Genesis and the uh, law, and so they only accepted portions of the scripture. And you would hear these debates about who the land really belonged to. But the foundation of the argument was the book of Genesis and the relationship to the patriarch Abraham. Well, unfortunately, both of them are probably wrong. Because if you will open up your Bibles with me today, we will see from the book of Galatians that the Apostle Paul will argue that the land does not really belong to Jewish descendants, and it really doesn't belong to Arab or Gentile descendants, But in essence, the land of Israel ultimately belongs to those who are the descendants of the faith of Abraham. Now, in introduction to this, we'll turn this on. There we go. In introduction to this, we want to just review. We are in our closing section, the middle section of the book of Galatians. Remember, the first two chapters were biographical. The second two chapters are theological. And Paul is arguing that salvation and sanctification are by faith apart from the law and apart from the works of the law. And the last two chapters being applicational. Now, the Judaizers concept of salvation, what they were arguing is that we Jews are the people of salvation because we're the children of Abraham. Not only are we the children of Abraham, but more particularly, we are the children of Isaac. We are the heirs of the patriarchs. We're the inheritors of the great covenants. We're the children of the covenants. We're the covenant children of Mount Sinai. We were given the law. We are children of the law. We are... We are children of the covenant of circumcision, which they upheld. Keepers of the law. We are free men and not slaves. And the matter of fact is, because we are free men and not slaves, you ought to cast out the Gentiles. And so that's what the Jews, the Judaizers, those who are trying to convert the Galatians either back to Judaism or into Judaism, would argue. But the Apostle Paul is going to take 
their argument and turn it back on themselves through an allegorical story about Hagar and Sarah. Look, if you will, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. The apostle Paul says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? Do you really know what the law says about this issue? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. Now, if you're taking notes, there's two passages that you're going to want to write down. The first one is Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 16, that speak of the birth of Ishmael. And you remember about the birth of Ishmael, uh, Sarah and Abraham had remained childless for probably 50 plus years. And Abraham wanted an heir, and it wasn't going to be Lot, and it wasn't going to be Eleazar, and it was going to be somebody from his body. And so Sarah goes through what is the culturally acceptable practice of saying to Abraham, take my handmaiden, have a child with Hagar, and let that child be the son for the family, let that child be the heir. And so they did. Abraham listened to the voice of his wife. No comments, men. Now, Isaac is in Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 21. And in Genesis chapter 21, you remember that an angel appears to Abraham right after the covenant of circumcision and tells him, Ishmael is not going to be the child of promise. And you remember Abraham's exact, uh, objection. He says, oh Lord, let Ishmael stand before you. Ishmael is now 13 years old, about to come into inheritance, right? And God says to him, no, it is not Ishmael, but you shall have a son of promise through Sarah. And you remember Sarah's back there listening behind the tent and she laughs. And she's gently chided or rebuked for it. And the angel says, when I come back a year from now, you're going to have a child. And lo and behold, we have the promise fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. Now, verse 23. His son, by the slave woman, was born, the NIV says, in an ordinary way. Well, I don't know what's an ordinary birth and what's an unordinary birth. But uh, I think what they're trying to say here is that his son was born by the slave woman by normal physical processes. But this particular phrase in Pauline theology according to the flesh, is the literal translation, according to the flesh, is a terminology that Paul uses when people do things according to a cultural, sinful, human way as opposed to according to divine guidance and direction. Like the passage that says, the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and the two are opposed to one another. In Paul's theology, according to the flesh, often refers to an inappropriate way or inappropriate direction. And so we could debate whether Abraham followed the will of God when he followed the cultural practice and had a child with Hagar. That can be debated. There can be no debate that from the time of the birth of these two sons until this very day, the animosity and the fighting between these two people groups has continued on. Well, it was in an ordinary way, but his son by the free woman, Sarah, was born as a result of a promise. Now remember, Sarah and Abraham had 50, they they had their golden wedding anniversary and no children. And quite frankly, the problem wasn't with Abraham. Because Abraham gave birth to a son through Hagar, and even after the death of 
uh, Sarah, he married a woman by the name of Katara and had other children. And it was simply this fact. The Lord had closed the womb of Sarah until the appointed time. And then he brought the promised child, the miracle child by the name of Isaac. In verse 24, he says, these things may be taken figuratively. The terminology here in your translation may be allegorically. Um, This particular usage of the Old Testament by Paul is really not allegorical interpretation like we know it today, where you, uh, like uh, Paul Bunyan's uh, writings or some of those of uh, C.S. Lewis, where there is no historical reality to the story and it is an extended metaphor and it is all fictitious and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, there are many people teaching the Bible who use an allegorizing or spiritualizing of the text all of the time. For instance, they would take like uh, the book of Esther, and Esther is the Christian, and uh, Mordecai is the Holy Spirit, and Haman is the old nature or the devil, and they will spiritualize the whole text. An allegorical approach to the text is just not valid. Now, I'm reminded of a cartoon that I saw one time. Uh, The pastor is driving home in the car with his wife, and his wife is sitting there very sweetly looking at him and saying, you know, dear, that was an absolute stirring message. Did you see that man in the front row crying and weeping so emotionally? And the pastor looks over his wife and says, well, yes, I saw him, but that was my Bible study teacher. (laughs) You know, so often we do allegorize the text. So it's important for us to point out here that when Paul uses this particular terminology of figuratively or allegorically, what he's really doing is he is accepting the historical foundation and he is building an illustration off of it underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which is a big advantage. And none of us have that same kind of inspiration today. So in verse 24, he says, these things may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants, One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponding to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Now, the terminology corresponding with is a word that was used in um, an elementary school in which the teacher would put something here and something here and compare them. And then it was like a grocery list of comparison and contrast between things. And that's what Paul is going to do now. He's going to make a list in which he's going to compare the children of Hagar and the children of Sarah, who are the real possessors of the promises of God. Now, In verse 25, he says, Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia, corresponding to the present city of Jerusalem, because she is in slavery with her children. It's interesting that in the Arabic language, the word that they use for Mount Sinai in the desert of what is today Egypt or Arabia actually is pronounced Hagar. And so when Paul speaks of this relationship of the Arab people or the descendants of Ishmael. Remember, Ishmael was promised by God to Abraham that Ishmael would be a great prince also and that many nations would come from him and that 12 nations would come from him. And the population of the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab community all the way over to Jordan today are probably descendants of Ishmael. And so this idea of Hagar being related to Mount Sinai was something that was even within their own language. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. Then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 1 when he says, for it is written, be glad, O barren woman who bears no children, Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman 
than of her who has a husband. Now, what is Paul doing with this quote from Isaiah chapter 54? Well, let's think our way through a little bit of Isaiah. Isaiah 53 is what great chapter of the Old Testament? Who does it tell us about? The servant of the Lord, the Messiah, he who bore our sins and carried our sorrows. Chapter 52, the end in chapter 53 of Isaiah, is all about the suffering servant, how the suffering servant has come and died for the people that he might make many righteous. And then chapter 54 is a prophecy to the city of Jerusalem during the post-destruction period of Jerusalem when it is a desolate city. And what Isaiah is saying to the people in that prophecy is that the desolate city will someday rise again in the blessings and the fruitfulness and the reigning that God will give him when the Messiah comes back, and the desolate city will be raised out of the ashes and become greater and more fruitful than the city of the past. The desolate woman representing Jerusalem destroyed, the fruitful woman representing Jerusalem of the past. And what he is saying, Isaiah is saying to the people, is the Jerusalem above is going to be greater than anything that was ever on earth. And so Paul picks up on that in arguing with the Judaizers. And he's saying to them, it isn't the earthly city of Jerusalem that means anything. It is the heavenly city of Jerusalem that is coming someday that will be very, very important. Now, there are some examples in the New Testament of this uh, concept of an earthly Jerusalem and a heavenly Jerusalem. If you're taking notes, you may want to write down some of these verses. For instance, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10 says, For he, Abraham, was looking to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Hebrews chapter 12, 22, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels, in joyful assembly. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, the one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write him, uh, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. Also, Revelation chapter 21, the great description of the marvelous Jerusalem that's coming down. What Paul is saying to the Judaizers is, you are focused on earthly things when there is a heavenly reality. There is a heavenly Jerusalem that is going to be coming down to us. And it is that heavenly Jerusalem where the true citizenship of faith allows a person to inherit and to reside for eternity. It's interesting in the Qumran community, better known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, you remember this Qumran community of of, uh, Jewish uh, devout believers, a particular denominational sect that moved out of Jerusalem, moved away from the worldliness of Jerusalem, and they withdrew underneath the teacher of righteousness. And we have to be very careful when we fall underneath the persuasion of a person as opposed to the word of God. For this teacher of righteousness pulled them out of Jerusalem into his own little group, and in that persuasion, he convinced them from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which calls them out to the desert, that's the John the Baptist passage, that they should go out to the desert, And then from Isaiah 54, the commentaries that we have from the Qumran community identifies this very passage, and they apply it to themselves, saying, we are the elect of God. We are the ones with salvation. How tragic that they would take a prophecy of God and misuse it and misunderstood it. Verse 28 says, Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. The Gentiles 
Paul are gonna, is going to argue, the Gentiles are the children of Isaac and the Jews are the children of Ishmael. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Verse 29, at that time, the son born in the physical way or in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. And he says, it is the same now. Now this is a very profound statement for the Jews to hear. It is a tremendous rebuke. What Paul is saying, you Jews are not the children of Isaac. You're the children of the law. You're the children of Ishmael. You're in enslavement. And you Gentiles who by faith have embraced Abraham, you're actually the children of Isaac. And just like Ishmael persecuted Isaac way back when, now the same thing is going on. Verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman. You remember what ticked Sarah off in relationship to Ishmael? Isaac was about three years old. And you remember the text says in Genesis chapter 21, it says, the child grew and was weaned. Now, in those days, mothers nursed their children up through their full second year, even into their third year of age. And the child grew and he was weaned. And on the day that Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of the son of the slave woman and her son. Get rid of this woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. It was a festival. It was a feast. And as Sarah looked over, Ishmael was mocking little Isaac. Now, do you remember what Isaac's name meant or means? Laughter. Yitzhak. The Hebrew word for mocking is sadik. The same sound, the same letters, a noun versus uh, a proper uh, noun or a verb. That's confusing, isn't it? <laughs> Yitzhak versus sadak. The Hebrew text is showing that probably what Ishmael was doing was mocking Isaac, making fun of his name, making fun of his character, and of who he was as a little boy. And Sarah said, that is not going to happen. Now, it's interesting, in the various archaeological uh, records that we have found of ancient Near Eastern culture, the archaeological records forbid a woman having once given her handmaiden to her husband and bringing forth a child forbid her from expelling that woman and that child. That child became the legal heir, equal with all other sons that would be born. But Sarah's going to have nothing to do with this boy and so she demands that he be cast out. Abraham resists for a short period of time, but then God reveals to him that he must let Ishmael and Hagar go because Isaac is going to be the son of promise. It says, going on in Genesis chapter 21, it says, what does this matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert, became a hunter. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Tragic mistakes have long-term consequences. Sarah went with the cultural norm, contrary to the revelation of God, one man, one woman. That's the basis from the book of Genesis. A man shall leave his father and mother. He shall cleave to his wife or be faithfully devoted to her. 
the two will become one. And comes forth Ishmael, who persecutes Isaac, even though he is cast out for thousands of years now, that persecution and that relationship has continued. Galatians 4.31, Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, he says, but we are children of the free woman. Who are the true inheritors of the Abrahamic promise? Abraham says, it's not the Jews, and it's not just the Gentiles, but it is those who embrace the covenant of Abraham by faith. Those who are related to Abraham through the faith that the patriarchs had. Verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, It is for freedom, or it is for the purpose of freedom, that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Paul is pleading with them. Don't go back to a legalistic way. Don't go back to a style of life that believes that righteousness is found in the law. Throughout this time, Paul has made contrasts of the two covenants in Galatians chapter 4. The contrast between Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac representing here those who are truly free in Christ because of faith. He says, you Jews really belong to the family of Ishmael, the slave woman, not the free woman, the one by the flesh, not by the promise, the one represented by Sinai, not Jerusalem, the one that are slaves and not free, the ones who come from Hagar and not Sarah. You focus on earthly Jerusalem, not heavenly Jerusalem. You focus on slavery to the law, not freedom. Yes, uh, um, Hagar was the fruitful woman, but the barren woman brought forth the children of promise. And you are the children of the law. You're born according to the flesh, not born according to the spirit. And your attitude is to cast people out, but in fact, you're going to be cast out. And instead, the children of Isaac, the children of faith, will receive the inheritance. In reality, Judaizers, you are children of bondage, not children of freedom. You are under a yoke of slavery. You have no freedom in Christ. What the Apostle Paul has done is he has taken the grocery list of salvation that the Jewish people felt was their authority, their concept, their theology, their rite of passage to salvation. And he has said, you are walking in a yoke of slavery you are walking in bondage. You see, the problem is that sometimes our human flesh just wants to do instead of accept. We want to earn rather than receive. And Paul has been making some very important contrasts between faith and the law. For instance, he has told us that the law was given to restrain sin. Faith was given to overcome sin. Do you want to overcome sin? You can only do it by faith. You can't do it by the law. For the law provides no inner power. It is only faith, walking with God, trusting God, prayerfully humbling oneself before God that provides that strength. The law was given to judge sin. That's what the law was for, to establish a way of judging sin. It is faith which was given to what? Provide forgiveness of sin. The law was given to lead us to Christ, Faith was given to lead us with Christ. It is the law that tells us that we're sinners. It is faith that tells us that we are saints. And that's a big difference. Do you think of yourself as a sinner or as a saint? I would suggest to you, you think of yourself, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, as a saint. Because that's the great emphasis of Scripture. You're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint. Yes, you may not be saintly all the time, 
But that is the process that God is bringing us on. You're not a loser, you're a winner. You've not been conquered, you're an overcomer. And that is what faith tells us. Faith keeps us going. Now, I'd like to summarize it this way. The Adamic nature knows no law. That's our old self. The Adamic nature knows no law. Until a person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, they are in bondage to that Adamic old nature. And when it's in control, it knows no law. It will violate every law. It wants to violate every law. It is only the provenient grace and presence of the Holy Spirit that re restrains our world from turning into total chaos and sin. On the other hand, the regenerated nature needs no law. The one who walks in the Spirit will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And now Paul will begin in chapters 5 and 6 to build practical, specific application into the life of the hearers if they have established these truths in their hearts. Cast out the woman is what the scripture says. And what Paul is saying to us is cast out the law, cast out the legalistic way, it is not the way of salvation. It is not the way of sanctification. Salvation and sanctification are by faith apart from the works of the flesh and the law. The Adamic nature knows no law. The regenerated nature needs no law. For the regenerated nature will be guided by the Spirit and by the principle of love and the inner presence of Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That is the life that God has called us to. Let's pray.